Sun Banana Upa Hamwe Africa listeners, my name is Kamakhelo Dinyukateledi and I'm one of the 2022-2023 non-resident fellows. On today's episode, we'll take a look into South Africa's arts and culture sector, arts funding, corruption and efforts to recover the stolen money. Now, cultural policy is defined as government actions, laws and programs that regulate, protect, encourage and financially support activities related to arts and creative sectors. Now, although cultural policies differ from one country to another, they generally aim to improve the accessibility of arts and creative activities to citizens. Unfortunately, the growth and development of creative economy on the African continent has not only been hampered by inadequate investment, but by corruption as well. In 2020, South African President President Cyril Ramaphosa announced a relief fund of 300 million rand for artists and athletes. Unfortunately, most of that money was looted and lost to corrupt activities. Now, in 2021, artists camped outside the National Arts Council, demanding accountability for the money which the former sports, arts and culture minister, Natim Tetwa, admitted that had just gone missing from the Presidential Employment Stimulus Program. That matters now with the public protector and a forensic investigation is underway while the CEO and CFO have been suspended. Now to help me unpack this discussion, I'm joined by journalist and cultural commentator Bongani Masangu. And in the second segment of our episode, I'll be joined by veteran actor and chairperson of the SA Guild of Actors, Jack uh, Devnarin. Bongani, thanks for joining us. Now, coming out of apartheid, now... What did the arts and culture uh, sector seek to do in order to, you know, bolster unity and the social cohesion and this idea of a rainbow nation? Well, it all started good when um, we had the white paper on arts and culture in 1986. We had the white paper on broadcasting also in 1996. And then Jane Idu was the Minister of Communications back then. Progressive, very progressive policies. Um, I remember a couple of years later, I went to Norway and we were applauded for having the best policies in the entire African continent when it comes to arts and culture, the preservation, the promotion, and the protection of arts and culture in, in South Africa. So we started very well with good documents. You know? And when you read the documents of the ANC, uh, communications, arts and communications documents of the ANC, they also a beautiful document on what is supposed to happen uh, when it comes to arts and culture. Just a bit of it, uh, the white paper on broadcasting was talking about prioritizing local content, South African content on uh, South African radio and television, which is good news because when you prioritize local content, then it means you're going to create a lot of employment for creatives in the country, not just the creatives, because remember there are people behind the scenes who work with creatives. This could be accountants, it could be lawyers, cleaners, drivers, you just need them, technicians, all of them. So you will create a whole lot of employment in that space, just in that space. You know, so so we started well. And if you look at the US, the Hollywood makes a 60% of its income outside of America. So, so they export a lot of their cultural produce from films to music and all of that. It's mainly film and music. That's where they make most of their money from outside the USA. So with those policies, we started well. We stood an opportunity to also export a lot of what is ours in South Africa in terms of culture. And uh, we had a good track record uh, moving from upper date to 1994. We had a good track record of, uh, 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 of artists that uh, dominated the world or made an impact on the world. Huma Sikela, Grazing in the Grass, Miriam McKenna, Katapata, Jonathan Butler, Hila Oland, um, Lady Smith, Black Mambazo. In fact, Mbagala music, which is an authentic South African music, helped bring Paul Simon from the Doll Drums and helped him with the album Graceland, because that album is a Batana album, it's a South African album, it's dominated by the accent of South African music. So it helped bring him back from the doll drums and he won a Grammy, a Grammy Award for that, for that album. So, so in 1994, when they came up with these policies, it was, it was good policies that would have built on what is already there. We are not starting from scratch, impact globally. We already have a, an imp, a, 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 a footprint, you know. Uh, Kaifa Semenya worked with uh, 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 Quincy Jones on the 
on on the on the on the production, the roots. Uh, they did music uh, together. Uh, 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 Nathan Bulu features in some of Michael Jackson's songs, uh, Liberian Care. So we already had an impact, a footprint in the world. So it was just a matter of building on what we already had out there in the world in terms of exporting what we had culture. So what went wrong? When when did the the, the document, the white paper that was so perfectly drafted that um, was applauded worldwide, when did we take the wrong turn? Right. I, I may not be precise about when we took the wrong turn, but uh, I, I would I would say where we got it wrong is uh, not doing what because you see it's one thing to write a document and say this is it's like having a business plan. It's one thing to have a business plan. It's another thing to implement or to uh, bring into reality that business plan that you drafted. I like to quote uh, D.F. Malan, the grandfather of apartheid, um, Lindy Court uh, uh, at the University of, Free, of the Free State wrote a book about D.F. Malan, giving us a picture of who really is this guy. And uh, D.F. Malan says, um, a piece of paper means absolutely nothing until you put action to it. You can write beautiful documents. Have them lined up in cabinets. As long as there's no action that is backing up those documents, you've done nothing. And that's what the ANC has done mostly. Beautiful policies, beautiful documents, beautiful laws here and there. Action. You see, the ANC people are very quick at acting on things that benefit them. They've been very, very, very quick when it comes to that, you know. Uh, they spent serious money um, on, uh, like now they just came back from their conference uh, where Cyril Ramaphosa was getting back into. And then they come out and want to uh, make it seem as if they now go, because first they admitted that they failed the arts in the last 29 years of democracy. And they say they are going to do something about it, you know. And now we are going to have a, a director general that is specifically going to focus on arts and culture. But we've been there before. We've had a director general that focuses on arts and culture before. What happened? You know, the ANC had a te- has a tendency of prioritizing their own heritage. So taxpayers' money gets spent on prioritizing their heritage. And I'm not saying their heritage is not important. Their heritage is important. But the heritage of the PAC is also important. The heritage of the black consciousness movement is important. The heritage of every person in this country, in South Africa, is important. It's not the ANC heritage that is more important. So now they come back from this conference of theirs, and they talk about uh, uh, the liberation struggle heritage. We know what they are talking about when they are talking about that. They are talking about their own heritage as the ANC. Because they think the struggle is the ANC, and the ANC is the struggle. In their mind, the struggle is nothing without the ANC, which is not true, you know. So, so the the problem is the ANC takes action where it stands to benefit. Then it takes action where they benefit. Some of their people benefit. Then they take action. But where the majority of people in the country stand to benefit, they drag their feet. So you're saying right now the ANC does not benefit from our arts and culture sector. That's why they're dragging their feet. Right. The ANC benefited from arts and culture uh, uh, before 1994, greatly. The Amandla Project by Jonas Kwangwa helped spread the word around the world in terms of highlighting the challenges that had to do with the struggle in South Africa. The Mandela concert, in, I think in 1984-85, in London, where artists, global artists, not just South African artists, where artists came together and tried to highlight the atrocities that were committed by apartheid in South Africa. The ANC benefited from the arts pre-1994. Artists were dedicating themselves to the struggle and even helping the ANC ventilate its issues. You know, we're talking about visual artists, musicians, poets, dancers, singers. They contributed. So the ANC benefited from the arts. Now, come 1994, and I'm told by someone who is in the ANC that one of the things that O.R. Tambo said to the ANC was that when you come back and, and you govern South Africa, 
One of the ministries that you have to prioritize is the ministry of culture. And what did the ANC do? They did the opposite. Arts and culture ministry or department in this country is considered to be a department where they throw uh, ministers that they think uh, have not performed wherever they perform, they, they, they've been, or they see it as a donation of sorts. So they throw them there. The budgets are very minimal. The reason being, they have already experienced the power of the arts. They know how powerful the arts is. They know that if you have artists who are thriving and are not dependent on government, it will be difficult for you to control them. So you ration the resources. You make sure that the environment is not conducive for many artists to thrive. And when it's like that, then they will have to come to you for money, which is government. And the government is who? The ANC. And when they come to you for money, you are able to say to them, you know, I don't like that song. You see that song that you sang the other day? I don't like it. it a, stop singing that kind of song. I don't like that. You know, I did an interview with Puzek Kenitze, was kind of the artist, uh, back in the day. Just before 1994, he released a song called um, Emma Parliament. So, so basically, he says in the song, you go to parliament and have your own disagreements and disputes and quibbles. But we are the ones who suffer at the end of the day because of your whatever you do. And then I think just before the 2004 elections, he recorded song, a song that said, um, I will never vote in the local government elections because I don't see what this local government is doing. And I understand, I, I'm told by someone that uh, he was called by NC people and say, how can you sing a song like that? So then as much as we say we have a constitution that is robust and that um, gives room for freedom of expression, we are also saying that artists in a way are restricted based on what fits the narrative of our current government in the country. They will not say it direct to you or publicly. Let me say they will not say it publicly. But if they get you in the corner and you say, you know what, uh, there's this project I have and I want to apply for funding. Ah, uh, Chief, you know, Chief, we, we do want to help you, Chief. Uh, we, uh, we do want to help you, but uh, we don't like your stance. So we have freedom of expression in this country. But your freedom of expression is to a certain degree so you can freely express yourself about white people being racist in this country, number one. But you can't freely express yourself about the ANC looting. Mm. You can't freely express yourself about the ANC not delivering. You can't freely express yourself uh, about Palapala. You know, you can't. You know, uh, you will. You uh, you know. People are exercising their right uh, to defend Ramaphosa. But when you exercise your right to point out the flaws of Ramaphosa, you're some kind of bad person. So, so you see, there's, there's a... So we, 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 we are in a country where we, we, we speak left, we walk right. In terms of government, you know? The government says one, two, three, four, five. But they don't do these things. They don't even encourage these things. They will tell you, in, in front of cameras, they will say, no, no freedom of speech, la, la, la. But behind the scenes, they do something else. And has that speaking right and walking left, given the room for corruption within our organizations like your SAMRO, like your National Arts Council, has, when did it creep in? Was it because of that there's no direction in what is said and what has actually been done? Uh, as to when corruption crept in uh, at the National Arts Council, <laughs> I wouldn't know when. When, but but you know, with with politicians, you know, because remember, politicians know that they are not there forever. It's five years, it's ten years, and then they have to go. So some of them think about what happens after. You know, we must remember. Some of them they don't know anything except politics. They can't do any other thing, and we must also remember some of them are not educated. You know, they are not skilled in other things. Let me put it that way. Maybe. They are not skilled in other things. They are only skilled in rhetoric and, and lying. And the only space where they can lie is politics. It's difficult to lie in other spaces. 
So you can lie in politics and get away with it. Uh, what his name was here not long ago, um, the one and only Barack Obama. Um, and Cyril Ramaphosa was sitting not too far from him at the Wonder Stadium. And when uh, Barack Obama said, uh, uh, there used to be a time when as politicians we used to lie and, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> we'll get away with it. Cyril Ramaphosa laughed very hard. For me, that laugh concerned me. Why? I mean, here's someone who's saying that as politicians we lie. And when we get caught out, we just apologize and then we move on. It's just like that. And he's laughing. The reason why it concerns me is that this was a person who was lining himself up to become a president of South Africa. Now, if you're going to find it to be a joke that you can lie and get away with, because remember, when you are, your lying here involves livelihoods. What we've seen in the past, let's, let me say, six months, is the unraveling by our SIU with regards to corruption in the national lotteries. And many of those people implicated are artists themselves. These are art, very, an artist who holds an Oscar who is now implicated in corruption because their funding application said this is to develop this and that, this is to help these communities, but none of that was done. It was taken into buying businesses, into buying residential homes. Artists stealing from other artists in a sector that's already struggling? Why? Remember I spoke about the rationing of resources that we have in the country. Now, if you've successfully rationed it means you have a huge pool of hungry people out there. Right? And you must remember, artists, uh, uh, they also put themselves under pressure because when you, you know, are on television, you lose people, and suddenly you think you have to change your lifestyle and live in a particular way because you can see on television. You have to drive a particular car, you have a particular place, and all that. So to maintain that kind of lifestyle, it's very, it's very difficult to maintain that kind of lifestyle. So, so you will get a gig today, and that gig will not be able to sustain you for a long time because it's a temporary gig, and it doesn't pay that well. So you find yourself in that situation where you, you're not having as many gigs as you would like to have. Your lifestyle is getting affected. Then you are open. You are you know easy target for people who will say, oh, no, man, we can set you up. Huh? We can hook you up, you know. Um, we'll get you say a couple of millions there as long as you give us uh, our cut on the other end. So the art, the artist, or the people who was meant to benefit are not even considered in these discussions or in these deals of what I give you and what you give me and how we share this money. Remember, the discussion now is limited to how I benefit and how you benefit. It has nothing to do with with what you say you want to do. It has to do with bottom feet, man. You know, I need a meter. I need one million rand or two million rand. And the other one says, Ish, I also need a million rand. So how do how do you get your meter and how do I get my, my million rand? Oh, no, I work at the Department of Arts and Culture. I work at uh, the Lotto. You know, there's, you know, there's 10 million rand for funding and all that. Put in an application. I'll be your inside man to make sure that your application goes through. And once your application goes through, because remember, I can apply. Once your application goes through and you get that 10 million and then you're going through to throw 5 million at me through other ways. Now, in that conversation, there's no talk about what are we asking this money for? Are we going to do what we say we're asking the money for? Actually, how much does it cost to do what we say we want to do? There's hardly any talk of that. From what I understand, which is why projects are not implemented. Because if there was talk of that, you will see projects implemented. But the simple is there's no talk of that. So, so the arts is used to see for money out of institutions by people who have their own agendas. And those agendas have nothing to do with the arts. So that's how some artists get caught up in this thing. Because they have to maintain this lifestyle of a so-called celebrity, you know, and, and, and now they're not making a lot of money. They have to find a way of making this money somewhere, somehow. 
Because remember, they also don't have other, they don't have other business ideas that don't necessarily have to do with the arts. Some of them, most of them, right? So, so, and most of them take it for granted that if I am popular today, I'll be popular forever. I'll be getting gigs forever. But the nature of the creative industry, show business, is that you have a particular time when you are minting it, when you are milking it, when you are making money. And at some point, a new generation is going to come in and take over. Now, if you're smart, you then start thinking about what happens after, when I'm no longer as big as I used to be. Whilst I'm making a lot of money now, can I find certain investments that I can make, put money somewhere, so that even when I'm not making much as an artist at some point, there's this money coming from somewhere, business of sort, investment of sort. It hardly happens. So that's why you will find that some artists will find themselves in a situation where uh, they are duped by politicians into thinking that they can get away with, with, uh, with their estimated money. Do we believe that this money will ever be recovered? I mean, if we go back to uh, 2019 elections, there was this talk about we're stopping corruption, we'll put in the proper mechanisms, uh, this renewal project, right? You go back to the 55th conference that happened in December. Again, there's this, we have a, a strong stance against corruption. We have mechanisms in place to call those who have uh, um, stolen to, to account and to be held accountable. Do we believe that the money that's been stolen from all these organizations will actually be recovered and, 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 and used for its rightful purpose? And that's for the artists. Hmm. I don't know. Because remember, the money was blown, most of it. You know, it was basically banned. You know, when you ban money, buy a 25,000 grand shoe, uh, go to a party, out of the blue. That money is blown. Where are you going to get? Even if you repossess someone's house, you're not going to get all of that money back. So that money is gone. Most of it is gone. We can only hope that there is some recovery of some of that money where they can be brought back to the heart. But even before we go to the recovery of money that has been stolen, there was a story, uh, information about right at the height of COVID, when artists were starving in this country. You know, they were not working for two years, they've not been working. The same National Arts Council that we're talking about had the audacity. To take 65 million rand and put it in the reserve bank, saving something like that. And you will sit and watch the Portfolio Committee on Arts and Culture talking about issues or things that are happening in arts and culture. I don't remember this issue being really dealt with. How do you put away 65 million rand that could have helped people, artists, at the height of COVID, when they are starving, when they are not working? But you have the audacity to take 65 million rand and put it away. Reserve bank, wherever you've put that money. You have, you have the luxury to save. When people are dying. We're talking about the National Arts Council now. They have the audacity to have money saved somewhere, stashed somewhere, when that money is needed. These are the very same people who tell you that uh, we're not able to fund all the applications that we get because we don't have money. You don't have money, but you put you you put away sixty five million rand at the at the at the reserve bank, and then they have something called surplus policy there. You know, there are people who apply for funding and then they don't report, and then some of that money it's default, you know, and then it's held back by the national arts council, and they decide born, and they decide they are going to sit and identify projects born that they are going to give the money. Why are you not going back to some of the projects that you've rejected for one reason or another? And say, let's relook at these projects because we have money that has not been spent. Let us look at some of these proposals that were sent and we could not find because now we have supplies. Let's look at some of them and say, okay, M. Fedu, remember we sent you a rejection letter. Uh, it turns out we have supplies from the previous year. We've relooked at your application and we think it's a fantastic project. Here's some money. Do your thing. No, they don't do that. So it goes back to the corruption that we talked about. 
So the people who are at some of these institutions are not there to serve artists and the art. They are there to serve themselves. They are there to collect salaries so that uh, they live in and uh, don't have issues with people living in lavish houses and driving nice cars and sending their children to the best schools. All good for them. You know, and if you're doing your job well and you deserve it, you must be paid well so that you afford that kind of life. But if you're going to live that kind of life at the expense of other people, then there's a problem. We have an issue there. Do your work. Make it possible for other people to live the very same kind of life that you want to live, that you think you deserve. So that when you earn your salary, you earn it knowing that you've created a conducive environment for artists to live a comfortable, a financially secure life, just like you. Create the environment. That's what you are there for at the National Arts Council. That's what you are there for at the National Department of Arts and Culture. That's, where, that's what you are there for in government, generally, to create a conducive environment for South Africans to thrive in whatever field they choose. Why don't we have artists in these portfolio committees? Why don't we have artists leading these organizations? Why aren't the people who understand the groundwork, who understand the layout of the field per se, why are they not the ones who are advocating, who are, who are put in places to advocate for their artists in these roles? Well, it's an interesting. Well, the, the EFF has Ringo uh, Madhu, who is in the portfolio committee of arts and culture. Um, I'll answer the question this way. You don't necessarily have to have artists in positions of administration. An administration that has to be. You don't. There's no need for that. All you need, you need to have people who will commit themselves to serve the sector, arts, culture. So you don't have to be an artist, but you have to have the love and passion for the arts and the artist and human beings. Lastly, do you think the 2024 elections that everyone is now campaigning towards are likely to bring any difference in how our departments are run, in who is placed in which positions, or are we just going to have a different party using the same mechanism and perpetuating the same problems? We have reached a, uh, a uh, by any means, this is our situation. The ANC will fight tooth and nail to remain. They will do anything and everything in their power to remain in power because it's not good business for them to be out of the power. Where are you going to look if you're not in government? Where, where are you going to look? Where are you going to get the blue light uh, gate if you're not in government? You know? Where are you going to... Um, have access to private companies, you know, because they know that the minister and then they help you get some shares here and there, you know, get your children, get a gig here and there, you know, all these luxuries that you're getting in government. Where are you going to get them when you're not in power? So the ANC is going to fight tooth and nail. Um, so we cannot rule out the regime of elections. We can't rule that out, you know. Um, I have a feeling that their numbers are going to drop. It may not be a significant number, but they are going to drop. Their numbers definitely are going to drop. Their numbers. Um, there are chances they will come back. And if they don't come back, they will make a pack with one or another politician, a political group to hang on to power. Because, you know, South Africa, the last time I checked, our... Um, GDP was 1.3 trillion. That was one time ago. Now it's uh, over 2 trillion. That's a lot of money. There's no company that makes that kind of money in this country. So, so the South African government is the biggest company in South Africa. Biggest company. So a lot of money 
flows into that company. And the ANC, dirty ANC politicians, most of them, would like to keep their hands there. By hook or crook. You can hear them telling you, no, we're a democratic party, uh, would like the people to have the... Uh, they have tasted the honey. And most of them, as I said, most of them know outside politics, outside government, they will not survive. They are like fish out of water. Thanks for joining us, Bogadi. That wraps up our first segment of the episode. Let's take a listen to former Sports, Arts and Culture Minister Natim Tetwa speaking on those who are found guilty of mismanagement of government funds and how they'll face the full might of the law. After that, then we'll get into our second segment. They violated the National Arts Council Act. They violated their own meeting in their own uh, council meeting where they resolved that they would remain an oversight structure. But they didn't do that. They went and became adjudicators and got paid for that. Now, amongst those five members, two of them are still around uh, and three um, are no longer with uh, the National Arts, Arts Council. The two who remains. I have already written to them and I've given them time, reasonable time, a week uh, to state their, their side of the story so that uh, on an informed basis I take a decision based on what uh, they would have said. To further unpack the call for accountability to those responsible for the COVID-19 fraud and corruption, I'm joined by Jack Devanarin. Thanks, Jack. Thanks for joining us. Now, before we get into the nitty-gritties of um, the corruption around the COVID-19 stimulus package, who do we blame? Is it the government or the organizations that are equipped with dispersing these funds? Which are government agencies anyway. So at the end of the day, government has to be held accountable. And I think if you go back all the way back to um, the start of our constitutional democracy, even though the, the mechanisms for government transparency and accountability were in place, I think they were never really used to their best effect, and particularly so in the creative sector. Because here you have a sector where we are, the majority of people working within the creative sector are engaged as freelancers. Correct. Which means it's very difficult to quantify the number of people on a payroll, for example, so you will have service providers, you will have performers who will come in for a day or a week, and you'll have performers who will be there for the, for the duration of the entire project, whether it's for six weeks or whether it's running for six years. And in that process, it's very difficult to try and work out how many people do we have here right now who should be protected under certain workplace regulations, under certain health and safety regulations. So with all of that, government has failed to offer the creative sector a structure for regulation, even for self-regulation, so that agencies, funding institutions, can be held accountable in terms of that regulatory structure. So the pandemic um, left a lot of artists, like you're saying, that most of them are freelancers. Um, it, 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 it presented new challenges for the industry. You know, people couldn't perform, work had to stop, but only... Uh, not only that, but load shedding presented a new challenge for the industry. Now, has these issues um, further worsened the decay that was in the industry or just exposed something that was always there that no one was actually privy to? I think the, the deficiencies and the, the glaring inadequacies within the industry were, were painfully exploited during COVID. And... Because let's face it, there were the, the fact that we were never a regulated sector from the beginning means that by the time COVID hit, it became the perfect storm that exploited what was already there on shaky foundations. And it meant that vulnerable performers who were already vulnerable, who were already in a position of precarious working um, engagements and contracts, meant that by the time COVID hit, everything collapsed. 
because there was no firm foundation in the first place in which to offer the freelance performers the stability that they needed, the security, whether it was um, some form of um, compensation or whether it was uh, supporting uh, income or whether it was social security. It simply wasn't that to begin with. And by the time COVID hit and government was now considering how do we offer COVID relief funding, by then the holes were already apparent. And when the money came in through COVID relief, it simply went out the bottom. And I like what you're saying because we have a white paper um, since the 90s and it's been getting rewritten throughout the years, but nothing's actually happening with it, uh, whatever's written out in the white paper being implemented. Now, is the issue in the creation of the, those policies or those um, structure, for lack of a better word, um, stipulations in the white paper as to what the sector should do, how government should support organizations, how government should support um, artists, is the issue in the creation or in the implementation of what is stipulated in the white paper? In order to have a draft white paper in the first place, you need to engage with the sector that you intend to offer um, government support to. So we don't have those structures that exist in any event. You have some organizations that work within the creative sector that carry a mandate. And then you have some institutions that are already established by government. So when you go about creating a draft white paper, you need to engage with the sector. But if you haven't created a sufficiently representative structure within the sector to engage with, then who are you talking to? Let me challenge you on that. Who is the sector? Because I know you're the chairperson of um, the South African Guild of Actors, which we'll get into uh, shortly. But who is the sector in our in our country when we're saying in the creation of the white paper, um, it should be inclusive of the main players of the sector? I mean, if you're building policy for certain people, in Speak to those people, right? Engage with them. But who are those people? Those are the people that include the creative artists, the writers, songwriters, composers, the bead makers, the cultural and heritage workers. You also have the dancers and choreographers, designers, architects, the people who work in the audiovisual world, in live theatre, events, music, including all the technical teams that work with them. The sector is vast. So, in the same way, you might be asking yourself, but how do we engage with the mining sector? That sector is vast. And I would simply point you to the fact that there is a collective bargaining mechanism that is already in place that puts people in a multilateral negotiating forum that is inclusive of all sectors or all, all the different uh, links in that value chain are all represented there. So I would say the equivalent should apply to the creative sector, regardless of how you might be um, presented, represented within the, the creative sector. You should have a right to be heard at an inclusive negotiating forum, which we don't have. Yeah, and why don't we have that? Like I said, you're the chairperson of the South African uh, Guild of Actors. Why, did, why was it necessary to have such an organization in the country? And... Why are they not more of those? Those workers and the workers in the creative sector, note I'm saying workers in the creative sector, is that those ones within the health or the mining or manufacturing or corporate or financial sectors, they are engaged as employees. If you're a freelancer working in the creative sector, you are not considered an employee. You are a freelancer. And what that means is, under the Labor Relations Act, you'll find that employees are protected under the right to engage in industrial action, including the right to create a union, to establish a union, participate in its activities, and all of that. But if you are a freelancer, you are specifically excluded from the Labor Relations Act, which means I couldn't form the South African Union of Actors. I had to form a South African Guild of Actors. So I had an, a representative organization that's member-based that could represent the professional rights of a group of professionals working within a certain sector. But I could not unionize 
because as a freelancer, yeah. we are specifically excluded from that right under the LRA. And do you think uh, we should move then into a, a space where actors are then considered as employees? Because now if you're looking at how excluded they are, if we talk about UIF, you're not, you're not included in that. If you get injured at work, it's a, it's a slippery slope in terms of whether you're covered or not and whether your, your employee, employer will take responsibility for that or whatever you're contracted to. If you're sick, you don't have any sick days. If you don't, if you don't work, you don't get paid. Should we then try to move to a space where creatives are seen as employees rather than contra- independent contractors or freelancers? Turning a freelance worker into an employee doesn't resolve the issue in our sector. And I'll give you a good example. Imagine if I was going to be paid to do a 30-second radio commercial in a studio just like we are in right now. I would come in and there'd be the sound engineer and there would be the client representative and somebody from the uh, ad agency. I'd be given a script. And typically, as you know, the radio commercial would be about 30 seconds long. So we'd go through the script. I'd read it. I'd do a few reads, get the timing right, make sure the certain emphasis and the brand name goes out. If I was in studio for 15 minutes in that engagement as a freelancer, do you think it's fair that I should qualify for annual leave? Hmm. Because it was just a one-time gig. Yeah. Correct. And many of my gigs are like that. If I have to go in to a casino to do a draw as an MC, or if I go in to do um, I've, I've got a major wedding event coming up and I've been asked to MC that. I'm there for maybe four hours at most. Should I qualify for sick leave? Should a woman qualify in that, in that context for maternity leave? So these are the dynamics of the industry that make us so unique and different from other industries, which is why we cannot simply say we are going to impose labor law, the vast regime of labor law, and and just simply apply that as a cookie cutter into the creative sector. That doesn't answer the question. What we are looking for is a much more nuanced approach to under which, what kinds of work would best allow you to get certain benefits that already exist under labor laws. So if I'm on a SOPI, for example, and I've been there for 15 years, as I was on Isidingo, it should be right that under those circumstances, that certain labor laws do apply. For example, um, if I work for more than 22 hours per week on one production, I am considered, according to SARS, to be an employee. Yeah. But not for labor law. So there's, there's a huge gap. And this, this is why we, are, we cannot afford to approach this problem in silos. We cannot afford to have the Department of Employment and Labor on one side, SARS on another side, the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition on the other side, and the Department of Arts and Culture on the other side, and the Department of Communications on the next. That does not resolve the problem. We need them to approach the creative sector together so that we can try and resolve what is the status of the performer. So we are hoping, and there's, there's already discussions taking place in this regard. In 2019, the Department of Employment and Labor initiated um, an engagement with the creative sector to say, help us to understand you. And that resulted in a number of engagements, some of which took place face to face. By then we will be COVID, yeah, virtually. Uh, Discussions resumed online and they continue today. What they asked the creative sector to do is you tell us what kind of regulation would work best for you. And you would know, hello, in this country, it is unlawful to have children under 18 engaged in work. You cannot employ a 10-year-old. You cannot call a 12-year-old a worker. That's not allowed by law. And yet, how is it that we see them in TV adverts and in movies 
and in TV series and soapies and dramas. How is it that children are allowed to work under those circumstances? The answer lies in the fact that the Department of Employment and Labor had to issue a sectoral determination that basically is an exception that allows children to work under certain circumstances. And those circumstances are defined by the sectoral determination. You're saying this happened in 2019. Are we not too late? Because what we're seeing is there's been a lot of exploitation in our industry. If you're a freelancer, whatever you're getting paid or whatever I'm getting paid for the same job is based on how your agent or how you're negotiating, right? We can do the same thing, but obviously our rates will not be the same. Our hours will not be the same. But then we're seeing a lot on with the era of social media, uh, the, the Tabo Best, uh, Be, Besta, uh, the Facebook rapist who would lure girls in and giving them hopes of uh, giving them a career in the arts and giving them fame and whatever. Does it not allow for areas of exploitation because there's no clear grounds? The fact that we don't have a regulated sector creates fertile ground for exploitation for unfair working conditions, abuse, and yes, even criminality. And we are seeing this when people create bogus actor agencies. There's a number of them on Facebook, and we're trying to address them through various um, film commissions, provincial film commissions. And this is exactly what happens when you don't have a regulated sector because it doesn't require a license to call yourself an actor's agency. We are trying to address this. I think the real question, perhaps what, what you may have been alluding to, is the freedom to contract. Nothing should stop or limit your freedom to contract in any way. And we agree with that. Simply by imposing a regulation in the sector, or the ability to self-regulate is not in itself a limitation to the freedom of contract. You still have, as, as I do on a regular basis, um, there's a student production that's taking place and they would say, uh, Jack, if you're available, we need three hours of your time. Would you mind coming in to be a kind of a mentor to these students, producers, directors, and actors? There's just two or three scenes we need you to do. It's a pivotal character. We think it's right for you. I would absolutely consider doing something like that, and I have. Free of charge. I'm not going to charge you for that. Why? Because I believe I have a responsibility as an industry veteran to be giving back and to be guiding and inspiring and mentoring, to some extent, the young talent that is going to be the future of our sector. Ultimately, the, the question is, are we, are, we pre, are we creating a sector for these young, talented individuals to, to flourish in? Or are we simply setting them up for failure? And we, we cannot, as industry players, be giving somebody a sector that remains unregulated, which creates the situation that is ripe for unfair exploitation and abuse. Hmm. So the sectoral determination is what we are looking for in order to create the kind of nuanced regulation that is going to allow the, the, the radio presenter or the performer or the technical crew to set the rules for themselves. Let us draft together that employment, not, forgive me, it is not the employment contract, it's an important correction. It is the, the contract of engagement so that this person remains a worker under certain circumstances that they were able to choose for themselves in collaboration with the person who engaged with them. Do we agree that these working conditions that they're going to draft are going to constantly be changing? And I mention this because because of COVID, our industry had to move into the digital sector, right? We had to now move into uh, recording theatre shows or someone recording from their home or how um, TikTok has taken over, that actors are now getting cast from uh, certain social media platforms. Is That definitely has to change, do you not think so? That whatever that was relevant in 2019, before the pandemic, before um, digitalization took this, the form that it is now, 
those rules or those requirements may not be very relevant in the next five years when, let's say, we are shooting a YouTube uh, series on my phone and we're not working in the same conditions that people who drafted those regulations were working in in 2019. That's right. It is a dynamic, versatile space and our industry has always been that. Perhaps we've been limited by technology. At the very beginnings of our industry, what did we have for entertainment but live theatre? That was it. That was it. Which is why when government promulgated the Performers Protection Act, that was in 1967. And it will terrify you to think that since 1967, the forms in which we were able to perform from theatre into television. Television arrived in 1979 or 1978, I think it was. And since then, we moved on to VHS and then DVD. And from there, the internet, YouTube, streaming, social media. And now we have, we have more forms than we ever imagined possible in which to create and consume content. But what do we have to protect us in a statutory sense? A 1967 law that, was, that became obsolete just nine years after it came into being. So we, when we draft policy and when we draft legislation, we need to keep it future focused. And the wording of that legislation or policy needs to be positioned in such a way that allows us to be versatile and flexible so that you don't limit the scope of the protection or the enabling nature of that policy. It needs to allow for adaptation for disruptive technologies that go into the future. What we have right now, because of the lack of regulation, are performer contracts that are drafted by broadcasters. Only broadcasters. Actors are not allowed input in that because remember, we don't have the collective bargaining mechanism. So the broadcaster will sit there, draft a contract that suits only them. And I am then required to sign that whether I want the job or not. If I sign it, it's taken as given that I now have consensus with the broadcaster. I can't dispute that contract now because I signed it. That mm. assumes consensus. If I decide that I don't like the terms of that contract, then I don't sign it. But if I don't sign it, the job is gone. The job is gone. And I can't challenge the terms of that contract because there is, no con there is no relationship between me and the broadcaster. So how do I change this? So nothing changes. That is why you've got broadcaster contracts that will literally tell you, you are signing away any rights you may have to your image or your performance, no matter how we use this performance on any medium that exists right now, or any technology that may exist in the future, and you're signing this away in perpetuity. So those contracts have future-proofed themselves, and they've basically bought out any right you may have to any commercial exploitation or any repeat broadcast that they may enjoy, giving the full commercial benefit to the broadcaster. And yet you have signed away any claim, no matter how they use that, even if that technology or this or the medium itself has not yet even been created for the rest of eternity. So we, that is why we need to change that. And, and we need to allow the kind of scope for change and new technologies and draft that wording into the enabling policy, into the enabling legislation that the broadcasters are using to, to strangle me with. Yeah, the the work that is done by the uh, South African uh, Guild of Actors. Please, for anyone who's not aware, our audiences from across Africa and abroad, what is the work, and and what does it seek to do? And and I know you guys were very vocal when it came to the generations. Uh, we have a soap in South Africa that's called Generation, and there was a whole um, scandal when they had to let workers go. The work that you guys are doing uh, in the organization. We are um, a member-based, non-profit organization. We are in existence for 13 years. SAGA, as the South African Guild of Actors, was created to represent the professional, 
contractual, legal, economic and commercial rights of freelance performers in South Africa. And we have um, an executive team of nine people around the country represented in Cape Town, Durban and Johannesburg. And we are all volunteers. So we don't get paid for the work that we do in supporting the rights of performers. And these performers are working in all kinds of media, including film, television, stage, um, voiceovers, commercials, uh, corporate work. And our, our task is to try to ensure that there are fair contracting conditions. And obviously, when it calls for it, the important advocacy work that needs to be done. Um, a lot of our work and time right now is consumed by making submissions to Parliament. There are two important pieces of legislation that are being considered by our lawmakers. These are amendments to the 1967 Performance Protection Act and the 1978 Copyright Act, which hopefully will give South African actors a right to earn royalties for the first time in history. And as much as that's important, I'd like to go back to the generations issue that you referenced earlier in your question. The reason Saga was vocal is because we had to try to correct what the actors on Generations were doing. They had led themselves, in our opinion, into a terrible corner. They engaged a labor lawyer who doesn't understand the world of the freelance worker. Every single performer who works on an SABC production, whether it's a soapy, a sitcom or a drama series, you sign the standard SABC freelance artists agreement. There is no employment. You are not an employee. You are not protected under the Labor Relations Act, Basic Conditions of Employment Act. You are not protected under any labor law that allows you industrial action. You cannot, therefore, go on strike. But they did. They thought they did. What they were was in breach of contract. What didn't happen to the producer's credit was that he had the right to sue them for the damages that were incurred as a result of what they had done. So do we blame that on the lawyer who, like you're saying, ill-advised them? Or are we blaming the actor who wasn't fully aware or didn't take into close consideration their working conditions and their contract with that certain uh, company? We, we have to lay it at the actor's feet. How do you not know the contract that you signed was the freelance artist's agreement and not an employment contract? How do you not know the difference? How do you not realize that you cannot take this? If, if you had taken it to a particular lawyer and you're going to pay this lawyer some money, is the lawyer going to refuse you? So the idea was that the lawyer was going to take on this case and pretend as if he was going to try to help them. It was not a winnable situation because you cannot take as a freelancer, you don't even have access to the CCMA as a dispute resolution mechanism. The CCMA is available to anyone. Except you. Except us. Yeah. Right. yeah. But then I want to then challenge you with this. Is I've studied from National uh, School of Arts right into my VITS degree at Bada. Nowhere was I taught about contracts. Nowhere in the process from high school, right through to varsity, right through to my honors, I'm doing my master's. This, I've never had to sit down. I had to figure out the contracts myself. Does this then go back to how these artists are being educated? Uh, and, and should then there be a change in that in terms of preparing them for the actual world and the, the legalities of the, the work or the papers that they sign? The educational institutions are the lowest hanging fruit when it comes to educating young learners about what are your rights, how are you engaged, what is the difference between an employee and a freelancer. If we are not tackling that at the institutional level, we are making a huge mistake. What we are worried about are those who are, who are coming into the industry who are not being produced by those institutions. They are the ones that we really should be worried about. Those who are discovered. That's right. Yes. 
That's right. And you'll I, and I know of producers. In fact, one of those producers um, was featured at the Royalty Sophia Awards, where they start a wonderful social media movement. Perhaps I shouldn't credit them for having started it, but certainly they were exercising it. They were they they had um, open up the industry hashtag open up the industry. That sounds incredible, quite revolutionary, in fact. Perhaps a bit romantic, but the truth is that the number of people who have come through that system who are working as principal actors on their productions, who are being paid the rates of background extras, is not opening up the industry. That is abuse. That is unfair exploitation. And I'm, I'm reminding producers, don't play politics in this industry by coming up with stupid hashtags that you're using as a disguise. To exploit... We have a new minister, Minister Zizi Kodwa, um, and he's been implicated in the Zondo Commission, and there's been, uh, the, one of the recommendations was he be investigated. Do we trust that the new minister, who is now taking on our Department of Sports, Arts, and Culture that has been marred by so much corruption in the past few years, to actually bring in some change and reform, or... Is he just going to continue the same path that we've seen from his predecessor, Natim Tetwa? Ultimately, these ministers are all deployed in order to tow the party line. They are deployed as ANC cadres. And it isn't so much what the sector needs. It's more what the party wants. So whether it's um, so-called Dr. Palo Jordan or, you know, whether it's Paul Mashatile or Natim Tetwa, Zizi Kodwa, they're interchangeable. It doesn't matter to them what the sector needs. It matters to them what the party tells them the sector needs, which is why you had serious issues with the original white paper and the drafting of the policy as a framework um, to offer direction to our creative sector was that if you don't have self-regulation, you leave too much room, too much authority in the hands of the government to direct your instinct, your impulse as a creative. And that's when you start to fall into needing to be close to government, needing to censor yourself, needing to adapt your creative impulse so that you are speaking more in terms of um, how to be aligned with the party, whether you are creating film or television, whether you are creating a work of art or even putting on some beautiful piece of live theatre, you start, as a creative, you start to align yourself more with what government wants. And if, you t- if you're asking yourself what does government wants, essentially you are saying, let's play by the rules of the governing party. And that, that has been the kind of thinking that informed the white paper until it, you know, it, it had to be redrafted because of an outcry by performers, artists, creatives, who stood up to say, you do not censor us, especially since we have we had to come through what we did and arrived at our constitutional democracy in 1994. We deserve the right to exercise our freedom and our creative instincts. And what we create needs to be free of state censorship or coercion from the state. And... Of course, the big question is whether the minister, the new minister is going to exercise any kind of guidance, um, any kind of helpful direction. And, and I have serious doubts about uh, whether he will and whether he can, in fact. He, from what I understand, he has no background or understanding of what it's like to work as a freelancer in the creative sector. So his, his first efforts at trying to understand the challenges of an actor um, is to speak to some industry veterans. So, you know, a photo op to me doesn't tell me that you're learning anything. And I, I start to confirm in my own mind what I suspected about you in the first place, which is to say, you are not serious. You don't understand what's going on. You probably never will. You will serve your time. You will eat, you will enjoy the perks, benefits and bonuses 
that come with the package of being a minister, you will achieve nothing except the annoyance of the sector that you are trying to lead. And we are back to where we started. Well, that's all we have for today. Please engage with us on social media on this episode. Until next time, we said anything. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Ufahamu Africa. You can find more episodes, show notes, and transcripts on our website, ufahamuafrica.com. This podcast is produced and managed by Megan DeMint, with help from production assistants Chukufunanya Ikachukwu, Alex Kozak, and Ami Tomaklo. Our non-resident podcast fellows are Bamba Njaye, Maseke Rioba, Takono Priscilla Semperi, and Kamohelo Tanigo Taletti. We are generously supported by the Carnegie Corporation of New York and receive research assistance from Cornell University and the University of California, Riverside. Our music is courtesy of Kevin McLeod. Until next week, Safiri Salama.